comprehensive uh, assessment of, of what they tend to have in common. Okay, so now that you know what the basic income policy is, um, we can say a little bit about why some people like it um, and, and why some people don't like it, what some of the arguments that have been given uh, for and against are. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, just in answer to your question, Evan, we'll talk a little bit about the um, the cost issue of the basic income and, and how much a basic income tends to be. That's a, that's a good question to ask. So um, the idea, just to give you a little bit of history first, has been around for quite some time uh, in one form or another. Uh, so if you do some digging in the intellectual history, you can find proposals for things that look a lot like basic income, even if they didn't use that name, going all the way back to the 18th century. There was an English schoolman named Thomas Spence, who is widely credited with being one of the first proponents of a basic income, um, though you also find a very similar kind of policy in the American founding father, Thomas Paine, um, who proposed it in a short little pamphlet called Agrarian Justice. Um, so it's been around for a very, very long time in one form or another. Picked up a lot of steam around the 1970s in the United States and Europe, and that's when you started seeing a lot of academics uh, get interested in this idea, and some people started to incorporate it into their research and uh, write books defending the idea. Uh, but a relatively small group of academics that didn't really capture much attention outside that small circle for a very long time, certainly not any kind of large scale public interest. That didn't happen until just a couple of years ago, really, just about um, 2015, 2016, when Switzerland had its referendum in 2016, um, which proposed a basic income for the country of Switzerland. Uh, it, it failed quite resoundingly. Um, but it, around that time, that's when you started seeing a lot of popular public interest, a lot of newspaper articles, about the basic income. And that interest has been sustained uh, more or less uh, ever since then. Uh, so what, what's what been driving the interest in a basic income? Why are people attracted to this policy? Um, I'll talk very, very briefly about five different arguments um, that tend to be given uh, in defense of a basic income. So um, the first argument is a kind of economic efficiency argument based on the fact that the basic income is a cash grant. And the argument is fairly simple. Um, it's that you produce more welfare. You, you make people better, relatively better off when you give them cash as opposed to when you give them in-kind benefits because they can always use the cash to get exactly what they want. Whereas if you give them an in-kind benefit, uh, they might be stuck with something that is less than the most desirable thing from their perspective, right? So they might think that what they really, really need is to pay their phone bill, right? Because they're a month late on it and you give them food stamps, which, okay, they get something to eat, but if they had the money <laughs> equivalent of the food stamps, they would have done something that from their perspective uh, made their family much better off, right? So there's a general economic preference for cash transfers when cash tra over in-kind transfers when cash transfers are policy possible simply because people can then use that cash uh, in the most effective way possible from their perspective. And the thought is they sort of know what they need better than uh, the government does, which leads to the second argument and very closely related argument uh, for a basic income, which is that it's a, uh, a non-paternalistic policy, right? So uh, it doesn't it doesn't treat adults like children who's, who need to be managed by the government because they don't know what's good for them. Uh, it provides people with um, cash and allows them to make their own decisions um, like adults, like like people who know what's best for them and can can make rational decisions in light of that. So it's like I said, it's related to the efficiency argument for a cash grant, but this is a more kind of moralistic sort of argument. The efficiency argument is people are just going to be better off if you give them cash. The anti-paternalism argument is that there's something morally objectionable. There's something wrong with treating welfare recipients um, paternalistically, uh, but that's disrespectful in some sense, uh, failing to treat them uh, as, as rational autonomous adults, to use kind of philosophical language. Um, so that's, that's a second argument. 
And again, I can talk about any or all of these in, in more detail in the question and answer period if, if you're interested in them. Um, another, a third argument is a kind of freedom based argument. Um, and it's that a basic income uh, provides everybody, everybody with uh, the what's sometimes called the material conditions of freedom, right? Freedom means, this is a controversial idea, well, it's a controversial concept. People define it in a lot of different ways. But one very common understanding of freedom is the ability to live your life the way you want, the ability to do what you want to do without being bossed around, without being stopped by other people. Uh, and a basic income provides people with money, obviously, right, which they can then use to avoid being bossed around by other people. So uh, if they want to spend time right, away from work, caring for their child. Maybe they've just had a child in their family and they want to spend some time um, you know, bonding with that child. The basic income provides them with the freedom to do that. Um, if they want to take time off work to uh, write a novel, right? Or, uh, or surf the beaches, the basic income provides them with the freedom to do that. It, it provides them with cash and cash in our world, in our capitalist economy, is a kind of freedom insofar as it opens a lot of doors for you that would otherwise be closed out. And one, one of the important features of the basic income in this respect is again, it, it like a lot of welfare policies, right? It provides uh, resources to, uh, to people, but unlike a lot of welfare policies, it provides it to everybody. And that's, that's tied in with this freedom argument, right? So um, it's not like a minimum wage, right? Where you only get the benefits of a minimum wage or if you're working or the earned income tax credit. The idea here is even the unemployed um, get some benefit out of a basic income. And so it's, it's a kind of universal freedom. Um, everybody gets the benefit. Everybody has some level of material resources that they can then use to exercise some control over their lives. Okay, so that's a, that's a third argument. Two more real quick, and then we'll get to some of the objections. Uh, so the fourth one, this is probably the one uh, that you're you're most familiar with if you've done any reading on a basic income so far, because it's it's one that gets a lot of attention, uh, both from the popular presses and from from some of the more well known proponents of a basic income nowadays. And it's what we call the automation argument. Uh, so the argument here is that uh, the future of work is radically changing, such that we cannot reasonably expect that in 50 years, 100 years, um, everybody who has a kind of basic level of competence uh, and responsibility is going to be able to get a job. Why not? Because those jobs are going to go to machines. With the advance of artificial technology, uh, artificial intelligence, rather, um, Robots essentially are getting smarter and smarter and getting able to do uh, more and more things that only humans used to do, like, for instance, driving cars, right? Um, right now, Uber employs people uh, to drive its cars or contracts with people. Um, in 50 years, they probably won't, uh, probably significantly less than 50 years, right? In 50 years, uh, most cars are going to be self-driving. Uh, and so all the people who used to work driving for Uber aren't going to have that option available to them anymore and think, okay, well, that's just, that's just one sector of the economy. Uh, but the thought is that this is a fairly widespread phenomenon uh, and it's going to eliminate a lot of jobs, a lot, especially a lot of the relatively low skill jobs that are available to the mass of the general public, right? So maybe university professors uh, like me will still have a job because it's, you know, it'd be hard to program a computer to do what I do. Uh, obviously, it's such an important and distinguished job, uh, but uh, but but a lot of jobs won't, right? Like so, you know, you already go into restaurants, and uh, restaurants are replacing a lot of uh, uh, service staff with iPads. Um, same kind of thing. So the idea is, like, how does that tie into a basic income? Well, if it's unreasonable to expect everyone to sort of go out and get a job because there aren't any jobs to get then what do we do with all these people who don't have jobs anymore? And the answer is, well, you don't let them starve in the street. Um, and you don't feel like it's so important to encourage them to go look for a work as many of our traditional welfare programs are designed to do. So you just, you give them cash and you let them, you let them live their lives as they want. If they want to find a job to earn more money or just to find self-fulfillment, great. But, um, 
you're not going to be driving to that. It's not going to be seen as a sort of an essential part of a normal human life anymore. Okay. So that's, again, very, very popular argument these days, very common. Uh, there's been a lot written about that. We can talk more about it in the Q&A. Last one, and again, I'll be uh, fairly brief with this. Um, the last one is, in some ways, one of the more philosophical ones. Um, it's also one of the older arguments. This, this is the argument you actually find in Thomas Paine um, and Thomas Spence, the, um, you know, the 18th century advocates of a basic income. And the idea here is that uh, a basic income can be thought of as a kind of dividend for the use of the Earth's common resources, right? So there, there are certain resources in the world that in some way belong to us all, right? Like um, the, the air that we breathe or the water or maybe the land that we live on, right? Like nobody made the land that we live on. We just sort of found it and some people put fences around parts of it and called it their own. But um, the thought here is that in some sense, all that stuff belongs to all of humanity. And there's some kind of injustice involved in certain individuals or groups of people cordoning off those resources and claiming them as their own exclusive private property. The thought then is that, well, OK, we'll let them keep it because there are certain kinds of economic efficiencies involved with private property. But we're going to um, require them to pay a tax on the unimproved value of those resources and we'll use the revenues from that tax to fund a basic income, to distribute to everybody. So it's like, even if you don't own any land, you'll still get a check in the mail that represents like your share of the common ownership of all the land on the earth. Um, so again, that's a fairly obscure philosophical argument uh, for a basic income, but it's a kind of an interesting one. Uh, Henry George, one, who was very, very popular in the United States in the early part of the 20th century was a big advocate something like a basic income on roughly those grounds. Okay, so those those are the arguments in favor. Uh, now let me talk about arguments against, and uh, I'll just give you three arguments against, um, which is a smaller number, but I don't know. They're strong arguments, so you can get away with fewer of them. Um, first argument, and, and perhaps the most obvious argument here, is uh, the issue of cost. How much is this going to cost? Uh, and a few of you asked about this already in the questions box. Um, and the worry is that it's going to cost too much, right? It's going to it's going to bankrupt uh, the, the federal budget. Um, and it might, depending on the version of the basic income that uh, you're proposing. And again, a lot of different versions are out there and they all differ fairly radically in terms of cost. So, OK, just to illustrate like what the what the issue is here. So the current federal poverty level Sorry, current federal poverty level for a single non-elderly individual in the United States is something roughly on the order of $12,000 per year. Okay. So, in other words, $12,000 is what it would take to lift that person out of poverty if they weren't earning any other income. So suppose you wanted to guarantee via a universal basic income that nobody was living in poverty, right? You wanted to provide enough money that everybody could escape poverty and therefore have all this freedom to live their lives as they want. How much is that going to cost? Well, uh, there's about 300 uh, million adult U.S. citizens uh, in the United States. So, you know, one simple way you could go about this would be to multiply uh, $12,000 by 300 million citizens. And that gets you a very, very big number. It gets you it gets you roughly three and a half trillion dollars, which is almost the size of our entire federal budget and uh, roughly a little over three times what we spend on all other welfare programs, including like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, um, at both the federal and state levels. So it's a huge, huge number. Um, so that probably won't work. You can't do something like that. Um, you got to find some way on cutting down on the cost of this program if it's to be economically sustainable. And some people think like there's just no way of doing it um, to make it economically sustainable. Um, at least, or to be a little bit more precise, um, there's no way to provide, to do two things at once, right? One of which is to provide a benefit that's large enough to do people real good, and the other of which is to provide a benefit that's small enough not to bankrupt the government. Uh, finding a way to do both of those things at once turns out to be very, very difficult. 
we can talk about that more a little bit more in the in the Q and A. Uh, but uh, I'll point out one complicating factor here, one really important thing to think about in, when you're uh, discussing the cost issue, and that's um, not just the size of the basic income, right? Is it going to be ten thousand dollars a year? Is it going to be five thousand dollars a year? Or something less? It's whether that basic income is being proposed as a supplement to existing social welfare policies or a substitute for them, right? So in other words, are you going to add the basic income on top of Social Security and Medicaid and all that other stuff? Or is the basic income supposed to replace a lot of those policies? Um, that's an issue that obviously has a tremendous impact on the overall cost of the policy uh, or the overall affordability of the policy. Uh, and it's an issue on which proponents of the basic income uh, disagree. So for instance, um, in your further reading list there, um, one of the books that I've recommended is a book by uh, the conservative um, thinker Charles Murray called In Our Hands. So he's, he's an American Enterprise Institute scholar uh, fairly, fairly conservative, uh, advocates a basic income, but only as a replacement for other welfare policies, right? Like he thinks there's all this inefficiency in the current welfare system and that a basic income would be much more efficient, uh, much do a much better job at providing people with freedom. Um, but he would not be okay with a basic income added to existing social welfare policies. On the other hand, someone like Philippe Von Parais, who wrote the first book on the list, Basic Income, A Radical Proposal for a Free Society, wants to see the basic income added on top of existing programs. Uh, and he's OK with the fact that that would result in a very, very large federal budget. OK, so the first first issue is cost. The first critique of a basic income is cost. A second issue is uh, and again, this is a very common objection, uh, is the issue of work disincentives. Right. So we've seen that a basic income policy is unconditional. You don't have to be working to get a basic income. You don't have to be looking for work to get a basic income. Uh, and as a result, people worry that, well, look, if we give people a basic income, they're not going to work. Right. Uh, and that would be a bad thing. A lot of people think it might be bad for a variety of reasons. Right. You might think it's bad because um, if fewer people work, then there will be less economic growth. Right. Our economy will be less productive because we'll have all these people sitting idle at home playing video games all day or, or surfing the beaches of Malibu. Um, and you might think it's bad just as a matter of kind of um, uh, moral idealism, right? There's, so there's a, there's a fairly standard conservative view. It's not just a conservative view, but it's especially prominent among conservatives that work is good for you, right? That it's part of a good, noble, dignified human life. Uh, and if a basic income would discourage people from working, uh, that would be bad. It would be bad because it would lead people to make bad choices about how to live their lives. Right? Uh, choices, in other words, that would, would make them worse off um, as individuals when you consider their, their whole well-being. Okay, last argument uh, against um, is, um, you can call the argument from fairness or reciprocity. And it's the argument that it is simply unfair to tax people who are making a contribution to the economic pie in order to provide benefits to individuals who could be making a contribution but choose not to. So, so the argument isn't that it's always wrong to provide welfare benefits. That's not the argument. Some people believe that, but very few people believe that, right? Most people think it's okay to provide welfare benefits to people who, who genuinely cannot find work, right? Um, so if you're trying to find work, you can't, maybe because you're disabled, maybe because um, you you spent most of your life in a certain occupation and now that occupation has been automated and so you've been, you've been put out a job by technology or by foreign competition. Uh, nobody really has a problem providing welfare benefits to people like that. The thing that, about the basic income, though, that makes it controversial is that it seeks to provide basic income to everybody, including people who just choose not to work because they don't want it. They don't want it, right? Like they'd rather they'd rather hang out at their house and uh, and read 
or play games or whatever. Um, a lot of people think like that's just wrong. It's wrong. I mean, if they want to do that, fine. But the rest of us have no obligation to support that kind of lifestyle. Um, so it would be, and it would be unfair for us to be forced to support it. Now, the interesting thing about that argument, right? That sounds like a kind of conservative argument. Like, yeah, these people don't want to work. They're lazy. Who, who you're going to make me support them? That's not fair. But actually, you find that argument a lot being expressed by people on the political left, right? So um, there was a famous philosopher, uh, a famous liberal uh, kind of left-wing philosopher um, in the 1970s, probably the most famous political philosopher of the 20th century named John Rawls, um, who advocated for a very kind of egalitarian state with a lot of taxes on the rich and a lot of transfers to the poor. But he thought that basic income was a horrible idea. And his reasoning was just this sort of reciprocity reason. It's like you have a claim to be provided with um, a basic level of support only if you're willing to make some contribution to the system yourself. Interestingly, uh, Marxists also tend to object to the basic income on precisely this ground. Uh, and you might like a lot of people think basic income sounds like communism, right? Like everybody's going to get money no matter how much they work or how little they work. Uh, and in fact, um, Marxists actually don't like the basic income. And the reason is they think it's exploitative in the same way that they think that capitalism is exploitative, right? So, so what's the problem with capitalism for a Marxist? The problem is that capitalists, a certain class of people, capitalists who own the means of production can reap the benefits without actually having to do any work, right? It's the proletariat that's doing all the work. Um, they're the ones building stuff and the capitalists just kind of scoop income off the top of that. Um, so the, the problem Marxists have with capitalism is that non-workers are able to exploit, that is to say, live off the productive uh, powers of, of the people who are actually doing the work. And the basic income looks like it does exactly the same thing, right? It allows the non-workers to live off the fruits of uh, the people who work. So um, it's not just a conservative argument. It is an argument that some conservatives make, um, but there are a lot of really influential thinkers on the uh, on the left to make a similar kind of fairness based or reciprocity based argument. OK, so those are in very brief form the major arguments against a basic income and for a basic income. There are others as well um, that I haven't gone into just because they're not as prevalent in um, in the uh, in the public debate. Uh, and of course, there's a lot more to be said about each and every one of those arguments, right? So every one of those arguments has a counter argument on the other side and there's a response to that counter argument. So, so we can talk about any and all of that stuff um, that you'd like. Uh, I'm going to stop with my formal presentation now and, um, and just respond to your questions uh, and, and uh, um, try to tell you more about, about what you're interested in hearing. So uh, I think... I think this is all done through text, right? Um, you don't actually speak. Yeah, okay, let me let me take a look here and see uh, what you guys have asked so far. How much does a UBI need to be in order to be considered a UBI? Uh, asks Evan fairly early on. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, cut and dried answer to that question. So uh, a, a basic income can be very small and still be considered a basic income policy as long as it's a cash grant, as long as it's unconditional, um, um, maybe tends to be individual. Um, and and there, are, there, there are different philosophies on this, on how big a basic income should be, right? Like obviously one of the considerations is cost. You don't wanna make it so large that it's completely unaffordable. Um, but there, there's also disagreement about the size of the basic income that's rooted in differing views about what the purpose of a basic income is. Okay, so some people think that the purpose of a basic income should be to allow individuals the ability to live a decent life without having to work at all, right? That it could be a complete substitute for a traditional work. Now, if you think that, if that's your view of what a basic income should do, then obviously the level of the basic income has to be relatively high in order to achieve that purpose. Right? 
Other people, though, think that the purpose of a basic income should simply be a kind of top off. Um, it should not be enough for a person to live on. That's not the point of a basic income. Some people say the point of a basic income is simply to provide uh, enough money that people can get by if they're between jobs, right? Like if they they lose their job for some reason, the basic income gives them something of a cushion um, that they can use until they find their next job. Or if they want to take some time off to be with their family or stay in school a little bit longer, right? Or go back to school. Um, maybe the basic income can help them do that, but it's not intended to be a substitute for work. If that's your view of the basic income, then it doesn't need to be nearly as high and can be relatively low, right? It could be maybe like $500 a month um, and still be a basic income on that view. So um, yeah, the, the, the levels at which basic incomes are uh, proposed really are, are all over the map, um, both for kind of pragmatic reasons and for for the, for the reason that different people have different uh, understandings of, of the purpose that a basic income ought to serve. Um, as the resolution states a, a S7, a uh, universal basic income, does that mean all 300 million citizens of the US get it? Do the lower classes get more, et cetera? Um, depends. <laughs> well, mo the answer to most of these questions is gonna be it depends, right? So do all citizens get it? Uh, depends on the proposal that you're looking at. Some proposals say children don't get it, right? So automatically you're ruling out like one large class of individuals. Um, some proposals ru would rule out felons. Somebody asked about, Trent asked about felons. Some proposals would say you don't get it if you're a felon, you forfeit that. Um, one interesting category of individuals um, that's, that's worth thinking about are um, non-citizen um, uh, resident aliens. Right. So the question would would individuals like that get it or another related category? Um, what about new immigrants, newly um, uh, newly minted citizens of the United States? Should they get a basic income? The, the worry there is that if you say that anybody who becomes a citizen of the United States gets the basic income, then that's going to lead to. Fairly strong resistance among some groups to increased or even continuing existing levels of immigration in the country, right? The idea, the worry is like, look, if, if every immigrant who come here, like all of a sudden the taxpayers are on the hook for paying that person a basic income, then like, we don't want any immigrants anymore. Um, that's a worry. That's a worry that people who are like favorable to immigration have, right? They like immigration. They think it's a good thing. And they worry that a basic income would kind of undermine uh, the political, uh, feasibility of immigration policies. And there's some empirical literature to suggest that in general, the more robust a welfare state, the less political support there is for higher levels of immigration. Um, so, uh, yeah, it depends. Um, you know, different policies rule out different people. They generally say that lower classes don't get more, right? So generally speaking, the level of benefit is constant. Um, regardless of your, your level of income or wealth. Although there's one version of the basic income kind of that's, that's not like that. So there's a policy called the negative income tax, which is associated with the uh, libertarian economist Milton Friedman. This is something that he advocated at first time, I believe, in the 1970s. And the negative income tax is kind of like a, a basic income, um, but a, a means-tested version of a basic income. And the way it works is, um, well, so think about how a regular income tax works to start. So with a regular income tax, there's some threshold. Let's say it's $10,000 per person. And if you make less than that threshold, you don't pay any income taxes. You pay income taxes only on whatever income you earn above $10,000. So suppose the tax rate was 10%, right? And the threshold was $10,000. If you earned then $11,000, you'd pay 10% of the difference between $11,000 and $10,000, which is to say you pay $100 in taxes. That's, so that was, that's a simplified version of how standard income taxes work. The negative income tax just does that in reverse for people who earn less than the threshold. So if your threshold is $10,000 and your tax rate is 10%, then if you earned $9,000, right? $1,000 less than the threshold, then you would get 
10% of the difference between what you earned and the income threshold. So in this case, you get $100. If you earn $0, uh, you get $1,000 in benefits. Um, so everybody would earn something, right? And, and so in that sense, it's a kind of universal income. If you had a negative income tax, not everybody would get something from the government, right? Because if you earned more than $10,000, you wouldn't get anything. But everybody would have at least some source of income either from labor or from the negative income tax. And the nice thing about a negative income tax is that it doesn't have a sharp threshold at which benefits cut off. And let me, let me say a little bit about that and why that's important. So suppose you had a welfare policy that says, um, like everybody earning under $10,000 gets $1,000 from the government and then nobody earning above 10,000 gets anything. If that was the policy, right? Then, and, and let's say you were earning like $9,500 a year. Uh, so you're getting a thousand dollars from the government. You're earning $9,500 from labor. You're getting a thousand dollars from the government. And then your boss offers you to work some overtime, which would push your annual income to say, uh, $10,500. If you work an extra, like 40 hours over the course of the year, well, what's just happened? You're working 40 hours more, but you're earning $500 less. Your income, your, your earned income has gone up from $9,500 to $10,500, but you lost your $1,000 in government benefits. So overall, you're actually $500 worse off, right? That's called a welfare cliff. And that's a dramatized ex uh, example of it. But you find things like that in the current welfare system uh, where your benefits just automatically cut off. And those, those provide a real disincentive for people to work because uh, the worry is if you work more or you, your income goes up because you get a raise, you could actually wind up worse over, overall um, by virtue of losing your benefits. Negative income tax doesn't do that um, because the incomes fade out gradually, right? It's like you, you lose 10% essentially of every dollar you earn um, by virtue of the lost uh, negative income tax benefit. So, um, so that's a kind of interesting uh, variant on the basic income, which is kind of means tested. And as a result of being means tested is actually much more affordable than just giving everybody, including like Bill Gates, $10,000. Um, all right. So let me, uh, let me read on and see what other questions we've got here. Uh, is it easy to apply for the benefits of a low income family? Are there any tactics to prevent and detect fraud? Asks Ingrid. Um, it, de <laughs> sorry, it depends. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure whether you're asking whether it's easy under the current system or it would be easy under a basic income. But one of the arguments for a basic income is that it would be substantially easier for people to get the benefits to which they're entitled than it is under the current system, right? So if you're getting welfare benefits right now, um, you're getting welfare benefits from a bunch of different sources probably, right? So you might be getting food stamps, you might be getting housing vouchers, you might be getting, um, uh, medical benefits, right? And you got to apply for all these things. You might have to visit different offices um, to fill out paperwork, all these different forms. It's, it's really not easy to get the benefits that you're entitled to, um, especially if you're poor and you don't have a car, right? And maybe you have to work during regular business hours so you can't make it down to the office. With a basic income, uh, on most proposals, it would be relatively easy to get your benefit, right? Like you file your taxes. In filing your taxes, you, you show what your level of income is um, on the negative income tax scheme, and then you get a check in the mail, like a tax rebate. Um, or if you, you have another version of the basic income, you just get a check. You don't even have to do anything other than maybe provide your social security number or something. Um, so it makes it a lot easier for the recipients to get their benefits. As far as fraud um, goes, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good... Like, I don't think it's any easier to defraud a basic income scheme than it is any other welfare scheme. But um, if the level of benefit is high enough, then the stakes are higher. And so the incentive to defraud the scheme are going to be higher. And so you might get more fraud as a result. Um, so that would be an issue. Um, one that some proponents of a basic income try to resolve by you know, sort of tying it to some kind of national ID system uh, of the sort that we don't currently have in the United States. Um, for my fifth argument, does that mean the wealth gap decreases? This is the common resources argument. Yeah, that is one of the arguments, right? So insofar as the existing wealth gap is based on control of 
sort of monopolistic control of, of common resources, um, then yes, uh, um, the basic income would, would probably have the implication that the, the wealth gap would decrease um, as a result. And, and probably on, on any version of the, or any argument of the basic income, you would, you would find that this result. Uh, Connor, wouldn't this increase our national debt? Yeah, maybe, uh, again, depends on, on the level of basic income. It depends on whether you do any means testing. Uh, I should say, right, so on the means testing question, um, any serious basic income proposal has to find some way of controlling the costs, right? You can't say responsibly, we're just going to double the size of the um, of the federal budget, and we're okay with that because that would likely have um, disastrous economic consequences, right? So almost every policy out there has some kind of uh, measure affiliated with it to control the cost, right? So the negative income tax does that in a fairly clear way. Uh, insofar as it, it, it does means testing on the front end, you might say, right? Like, so you don't get the negative income tax unless your income falls below a certain threshold. A lot of other basic income proposals don't do that kind of means testing, but they do another kind of more hidden, harder to see uh, means testing, which is they make the basic income grant that everybody gets part of your taxable income. And then they just raise up the uh, progressive income tax to the point where somebody like Bill Gates, right, uh, who has a ton of money already, he would get the basic income. So he'd get a check from the government, but he would wind up paying all of that basic income back to the government in income taxes. So you get the exact same result. They're functionally equivalent, right? Whether you do the means testing on the front end by only giving it to certain people or whether you do it on the back end by giving everybody the check, but then taking it back from those who are too wealthy. Same difference. Right. Um, but every policy has to do something like that. Otherwise, the cost spirals uh, utterly out of control. And, and so they all do like even Von Perais, who's um, willing to tolerate a much larger federal budget than we currently have. Um, thinks that some form of means testing of that sort has to um, has to take place. Uh, Connor, oh, okay, so you raised the immigration point. Good. So I hope I hope I covered that um, um, in the uh, in my comments. Uh, Evan asked, question: Could Rawls' veil of ignorance theory be used on the affirmative side, or could the negative shut it down and say that Rawls does not like uh, a UBI? Um, yeah, no, I think you. I mean, you could, uh, and, and I think you could use it fairly effectively. Um, on the affirmative side, right? So the, the veil of ignorance theory from, from John Rawls is that um, it's a kind of thought experiment to think about justice in society. And he says, like, imagine that you um, didn't know your place in society, right? You didn't know whether you, you, you were born into a good social class, uh, you know, an upper social class or a lower social class. You didn't know uh, what your intelligence was. You didn't know how wealthy your family was. You don't know any of these particular details about your life. What kind of rules would you like to see govern the distribution of wealth and opportunities in society to ensure that no matter where you end up in society, you're not doing too badly off? That's the basic gist of the, of the uh, uh, veil of ignorance idea, right? And Rawls says uh, that persons under a veil of ignorance would choose these two principles of justice, which would lead to a fairly redistributive social program, right? So fairly heavy taxes on the well-off in order to provide very large social welfare benefits to the bottom off, okay? Um, so I think you could, you could take that argument and, um, and make a pretty strong case for a basic income and say that a basic income provides the, uh, provides a, a, a threshold, a, a minimum level of income that nobody falls below so that no matter how unlucky you get, in what Rawls calls the natural and social lotteries, right? Like no matter how bad a family you get born into or how bad a social circumstance you get born into, you're not going to be desperately bad off because you're always going to have that cushion, that basic income to rely upon. It's true that Rawls himself didn't favor a basic income, um, but I, he didn't 
not favor it because he thought it was incompatible with his veil of ignorance argument, right? That it was, he gave a separate, distinct argument based on the idea of reciprocity against the basic income. Um, so I think you could you could disagree with that argument, right? You could say I don't think Rawls's argument about reciprocity works, and here's why. And in fact, I think Rawls's veil of ignorance argument provides a very strong support for the basic income, and here's here's how that would work. Um, so I think you could divorce those two things. They don't they don't stand or fall together. Um, Lauren asks, uh, you mentioned the referendum in Switzerland fails. Are there are examples even on a smaller scale where a type of basic income was implemented? Yeah, good. So I'm glad you asked. Um, there are um, uh, and, and a, a varying degrees of uh, success and scale. Right. So. Um, one basic income like policy that has been around for a very long time and that enjoys a great deal of popular support is the Alaska permanent dividend. Right? So uh, as you might know, everybody who lives in Alaska receives a check from the government each year, um, which is represented as their share of the natural resources of the state, mostly oil uh, revenue. Um, so the, the size of the dividend varies depending on uh, how much revenue Alaska has extracted from oil um, over the course of the year. Um, it's not enough to live on, right? So you, you couldn't view this as a substitute for work. Um, so it, it falls into the kind of top off category of basic income schemes, right? It's a cushion that makes it a little easier to get by if you do lose your job or makes it a little easier to maybe uh, not work and, and go to school a little longer, um, but certainly not to like support your whole family on. That's been around for a very, very long time. Um, it's very, very popular. People in Alaska love it, as you might imagine. Um, and, and nobody sees it as kind of bankrupting the state or encouraging idleness or any of the other kinds of arguments that uh, often get made against the basic income. Uh, so that's, you know, it's, Alaska is a unique place, right? Uh, they have uh, tremendous wealth and natural resources in a way that a lot of other jurisdictions don't. Um, it also is is kind of insulated from the immigration uh, problems in a way that other states aren't, right? So like it's hard to immigrate to Alaska uh, in a way that it's much less hard to immigrate to like Texas or something. So uh, they don't have the same concern that if they implement this, like everybody's gonna come flooding into Alaska. Um, so, you know, how generalizable is it? Yeah, I don't know, but it's it's an example. Um, there are also a lot right now. There are a lot of experiments taking place on the basic income where you have different jurisdictions running small scale pro, um, kind of project, basic income projects, and then looking to see how well they work and gathering data that might then be used to support a, a fuller, more robust implementation of a basic income in the future. So you have. Uh, basic income projects in uh, Finland. Uh, you have them in the Netherlands, in the Dutch city of uh, Utrecht. Uh, there's Ottawa has a, a, a pilot program taking place right now. Um, there's a really interesting uh, uh, program that uh, a charitable organization called Give Directly is running in Kenya, uh, in Africa right now. Um, which is interesting for two reasons, one of which is it's being run by a private organization and not by a government, right? So most of these basic income programs are government agencies, right? Using this as a kind of social welfare policy. Uh, Give Directly is raising all its money through voluntary contributions. And, um, and obviously it's, it's giving this money to people who are very, very, very poor. Um, and so the level of the basic income by like US standards is extremely low. But um, it, it makes a big difference in these people's quality of life um, because their their initial income is very, very low. So even a small basic income um, can have a, a fairly large effect in their overall income. So they're going to be doing this for like they're just starting out. It's a 10 year uh, program. They want to see how a long term uh, basic income works. That'll be really interesting to see what results it brings. One other thing I'll mention, just because there's a lot of data on it, and it's often very, uh, it's often widely cited in these discussions. Uh, so during the 1970s in the United States, there were a series of experiments called the negative income tax experiments, 
where Friedman's negative income tax or something more or less like it was implemented on a small scale in different cities. Um, and, and a lot of data came out of that as to how people respond to a basic income. It's a little controversial what lessons to draw from that data, uh, but that's certainly something you should look at. Uh, another one is um, in Canada, there was something called the Mincom experiment, M-I-N-C-O-M-E uh, experiment that was run in Manitoba, Canada. Um, there's a uh, Canadian economist, Evelyn Forget, uh, spelled like forget, um, who has done a lot of interesting work documenting the results of that experiment. Um, and, uh, and she thinks it was a fairly favorable experiment that uh, it had all these great benefits. People stayed in school longer. They had these long-term health benefits um, because they were able to get medical care early for, for problems that they were suffering. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of these experiments taking place right now and there's more being developed every day. So, uh, but, but in terms of like large scale statewide implementations, there's not much of that. Um, it might be in a couple of years. We'll see. Um, but, but not yet. All right. Let me keep going here. Um, What are some, so, so Rhea asked, what are some counter plans the negative could run to avoid answering poverty ceiling arguments or counter or any counter plans you recommend? Um, could you, uh, could you rephrase that a, a bit? I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely clear on what you're answering, asking. I think you, you want arguments that people opposed to a basic income could provide to, to avoid answering poverty ceilings arguments. And I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. So if you explain that. Uh, I'll try my best to answer it. Um, let's see. Do you think, David asked, do you think converting some of the total UBI to provide essential services freely and unconditionally, things like basic health care, mobility and transportation, food staples, et cetera, has any merit at all? Or would this be a worse solution than higher cash atonement allotments and lower direct provision? Yeah, good. So um, I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of people who argue in favor of the basic income, in fact, I would say most people who argue in favor of basic income do not see a basic income as substituting for all existing welfare policies, right? Uh, there are a few people like Charles Murray who tend to be kind of on the right end of the political spectrum, libertarians or conservatives, who do think that we should scrap all existing welfare programs and replace them with a basic income. But most other people think that this is something that we're going to add on top of at least most at least some existing welfare programs. We might, we might replace some of them, but we'll keep some of them too, right? So for instance, you might think like healthcare, there's something kind of special about healthcare in the United States, right? Such that the, the market is, is kind of an oddly functioning market and simply providing people with cash might not be as effective a way of meeting for their healthcare needs as would be providing them with medical benefits directly, right? Um, or like, I, I mean, just to provide a really obvious example, uh, think about things like mental health services, right? Or addiction uh, treatment facilities. You, you can characterize those as maybe as kind of a kind of social welfare program. And clearly they're, they're not the kind of social welfare program that you could meaningfully substitute with cash, right? Like if somebody's suffering from mental health problems, you can't just give them cash and say, well, here you go. Right. Do, you know, do what you think would be best with this. Um, so so the question then is, like, how much of existing social welfare programs stay on the table as they are providing in-kind benefits? And how much can you substitute with cash grants of the sort that a basic income would provide? And you get a lot of disagreement among people on, on that question. But I think most people agree some stuff still has to stay in kind. OK, I've got just a few minutes left here. Um, mm, mm, mm. could the universal basic income take money from the poor and give it to everyone, therefore increasing poverty and depriving the poor of needed target support? Evan, I'm very glad you asked that question. That's an excellent question. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure that it would have that effect, but there are influential people who have made that argument. So I'll give you one name. There's a guy named Jared Bernstein, who as an economist with, I believe, the Roosevelt Institute, but if you just Google Jared Bernstein, basic income, you'll find his stuff uh, really clearly. And um, 
He is a left-wing economist, so he's in favor of a much bigger government, uh, much more robust social welfare policies for the poor. But he thinks a basic income is a horrible idea for precisely the reason that you state. He thinks it would be regressive in its nature in that it would eliminate um, a lot of, well, if, if you substituted for other welfare programs, it would eliminate a lot of programs that are directly targeted at the poor. And then it would kind of diffuse that money amongst the whole society so that at the end of the day, uh, people who are genuinely poor might, up receiving, might end up receiving less than they would have under the previously existing policy. He has a very nice article where he makes exactly that point in a really clear and effective way. So that's, that's a nice place to look as a, as a resource for the negative. Uh, yeah, okay, you say you got it from an online source. That, that might have been uh, Jared. Uh, okay, I, well, Josh, it's 4.59, and I didn't see a clarification from Rhea of her question, so I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'll stop. Uh, those, are, those are really great questions. I wish I had time to talk to you more. Um, if you'd like to follow up with me uh, over email, uh, I'd be I'd be more than happy to to talk to you. I can provide you with some more pointers. Um, you know, just Google my name. You can find my email address really easily and, and send me something. Uh, so I wish you all the best of luck with your debates and uh, and thanks for coming out. All right, thank you so much, Matt. That was super helpful. Um, I just wanted to reach out to everyone here. I'm going to go ahead and put my email address as well um, in the chat box. Well. Um, in the chat box. Institute.org. Okay. Um, my email is now in the chat box. You guys can use that to contact me if you have any questions um, about other debate webinars, um, any questions with how to get in contact with Matt, um, any questions about the further reading resources. Um, so that's what you guys can use uh, to get a hold of me. Also, uh, this whole webinar recording is going to be posted on YouTube probably early next week. Um, hopefully late this week, um, but we're not really sure, um, so probably early next week. Um, and then you guys can access that on our uh, Bill of Rights Institute YouTube page. Um, and, and that's really all there is to it for the rest of tonight. I hope you guys had a wonderful time. Uh, thanks for asking really great questions. Uh, and thank you once again, Matt. I muted myself, but thank you too.